It's good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good. good. A little louder. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, there we go. All right. All right. Thank you all so much for coming to this very important press conference. My name is Lucas Franco. I'm here on behalf of Leuna, Minnesota, North Dakota, a union of 14,000 proud men and women who build and maintain our, st our state's critical infrastructure. And I'm so proud to stand here with many other folks from the building trades. We're here to today to discuss two important issues uh, at how we can get at preventing worker exploitation and the use of problem contractors on publicly subsidized projects. Minnesota faces a substantial shortage of affordable housing. And like all Minnesotans, our members also face challenges affording to live uh, in a home in Minnesota. Up to 10% of Minnesotans are cost burdened by housing, both in terms of renting and buying. Thankfully, the state and many other levels of government have really stepped up in terms of funding new affordable housing. But some of that money continues to flow to some of the worst of the worst unscrupulous contractors, and that's what we're looking to stop. Minnesota must meet its ambitious affordable housing goals without sacrificing worker dignity and respect. There are five speakers here today that will articulate the scale of the problem and detail vital legislative reforms aimed at breaking the cycle of unscrupulous contractors working on these publicly subsidized projects. So first, Jake Schweitzer and Arturo Hernandez will speak to the problems we are seeing on public subs publicly subsidized housing projects. Second, Representative Howard and Representative Coulter will share steps legislators are taking to address the problems detailed by Mr. Schweitzer and Mr. Hernandez. And third, Tom Dicklich, the executive director of the Minnesota Building and Construction Trades, will share some closing remarks, remarks. And we will take questions at the end. And with that, I'd like to invite Jake Schweitzer up to the microphone. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jake Schweitzer. I'm the executive director of North Star Policy Action. Uh, we're a think tank that promotes data-driven solutions to help working Minnesotans thrive. Minnesota faces a severe housing crisis caused by a shortage of affordable homes, and the problem's getting worse. The supply of low-cost rental housing in Minnesota has decreased by a quarter over the last decade. More than 10% of Minnesotans are cost burdened, meaning they spend more than 30% of their household income on housing. Now, thankfully, this legislature has stepped up, and last session, they provided record investments to address housing affordability. Most sources of public financing for affordable housing already have strong labor protections, which is critically important because wage theft and exploitation are persistent problems in the multifamily housing construction industry. Unfortunately, two of the largest sources of public financing for affordable housing, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, or LIHTC, and Tax Increment Financing, or TIF, are lacking in important safeguards for workers. In November, North Star Policy Action released our report called Subsidizing Abuse. This report named contractors that have been charged with or face allegations of exploitation according to interviews with workers or in, and industry experts. We identified housing developments that have received funding from LIHTC and TIF and are employing the problem contractors that we named. We found that since 2016, workers on 25 projects that received approximately $31 million in LIHTC funding were at risk of exploitation by problem contractors. And since 2018, workers on 14 projects that received approximately $53 million in TIF subsidies were also at risk. In total, over $84 million in taxpayer subsidies have gone to projects employing contractors with proven or alleged labor violations. As we speak, across town in Minneapolis, workers are gathered at the offices of a housing developer, alleging multiple cases of wage theft. That developer is currently seeking a low-income housing tax credit for an affordable housing project in Edina. So this problem is even larger than what we found in our report. When we say things like labor violations, worker exploitation, and wage theft, it can sound very general, very 30,000 feet, a lot of legalese. This dehumanizes the actual abuse of workers that is so common in this industry. In our report, we're talking about contractors who have refused to pay their workers wages and offer drugs instead, as you'll hear later, or use child labor, or threaten to fire a woman for reporting sexual assault on the job, or covering up workplace, serious workplace injuries. If you're a contractor who's guilty of abuses like these, you shouldn't be working on publicly subsidized projects. It's as simple as that. And developers need to be held responsible for the contractors that they hire. That's why the bills being led by Representative Howard and Representative Coulter are so important. Expanding prevailing wage requirements to LIHTC and TIF projects will protect workers on those job sites and across the industry from depressed wages. 
Increasing transparency of who's actually working on these projects will make it harder for bad actors to avoid accountability through layers of subcontractors. And increasing developer accountability will mean project owners can't shirk responsibility for abuses on their projects, all while collecting the profits. So thank you to these legislators. Thank you all for being here today to hear more about this important issue. Um, with that, we'll hear from Arturo. Good afternoon. I'm Arturo Hernandez, and I come to the United States to have a better life. And uh, I have a bad experience to one of the companies to I trying to work for. It's a paint in America. And I try to make application. These people send me to one to the subcontracts. Their name is Valenzuela. And I start to work for him for almost three months. And he pay late and pay short checks and sometimes don't want to pay. And the last time, he trying to don't pay me and pay me in drugs and told me to sell the drugs and I make more money to work. And I told him no, and he trying to push me to open a, co a company and uh, buy insurance and to work like that, like subcontract to make a big money like him. And uh, I deny because he's I'm worker and I trying to work right. And these uh, things happen very often by many companies around here. He's got to fight strong to stop these things because it's, uh, people wear a little money. Also to the Spanish people, is uh, to the people to give just a little bit of money to these people, just make a lot of money about to the hard work. That's why it's got to fight for. That's it. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Howard. And I'm the state representative and chair of our Minnesota Housing Committee in the Minnesota House. I want to thank uh, North Star Policy, and I want to thank Layuna and um, Arturo and everyone here uh, for shining a light on what is an egregious problem that we need to solve. And I can say for myself, when I first read this report, I really viewed it as a call to action, that there is no way, no how, that public dollars should ever support the kind of worker exploitation that was detailed in that report. And that's why we're bringing forward this legislation. It has a few key uh, elements. One, we're uh, adding prevailing wage to uh, public housing projects at 10 units and above uh, to ensure better labor standards. Uh, two, um, we're adding uh, more transparency because we believe sunshine is the best disinfectant uh, to force developers to list their subcontractors on the front end as long as well as any sort of labor violations they've had in the past. And then third, uh, we're taking accountability seriously. If a developer continues to engage in these practices, they will lose out on the opportunity uh, to, to receive public dollars in the future. Now, some might try to say, oh, if you, if you ask for higher labor standards, you, you're going to raise the cost of housing. This is going to make it harder for us uh, to, to develop housing. And I call BS. We absolutely can and must build more affordable housing across Minnesota, and we absolutely can and must do so in a way that pays living wages and honors and respects the workers that are building those homes. And that's what this bill will do. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Representative Nathan Coulter. I serve District 51B, which includes the eastern half of Bloomington in the Minnesota House. The bills that we're talking about today are important because as we think about the needs that we have for economic development and particularly the needs we have for affordable housing, Minnesotans deserve to know that their tax dollars are not subsidizing abuse and exploitation of workers. My bill specifically relates to tax increment financing, or TIF. TIF leverages the expected increase in property taxes to invest in the development itself. When used well, TIF can be a powerful tool to generate development and redevelopment where they are most needed. In my time on the Bloomington HRA and City Council, I saw several developments that would otherwise have not been viable move forward because of TIF. But the reality is that strong local oversight over TIF is uneven at best, and state oversight is usually limited to conversation and maybe finger-wagging in committee. Lack of accountability and transparency has allowed problem contractors to take advantage of vulnerable workers. 
As Jake mentioned, since 2018, $53 million in TIF funding that we know of has gone into projects where developers were found to have engaged in exploitation. Our communities need tools like TIF to encourage economic development, but that should not come at the expense of workers' lives or livelihoods. My bill would tie the use of TIF to our existing prevailing wage standards under current state law. Doing so will add transparency on the part of developers and give the state of Minnesota the tools necessary to hold them accountable for exploitation and abuse. And it has the added benefit of protecting the integrity of public investment. It is time for us to take action to protect workers and safeguard Minnesotans' public dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, my name is Tom Dukic. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota State Building and Construction Trades Council. We represent over 70,000 women and men who work in the union construction trades throughout the state of Minnesota. Everyone in the construction industry knows that the fraud you've heard about is happening. And when we say everybody, we mean everybody. It's just, it's just not the workers who get cheated out of their wages that know the contractors who are cheating them, they know. The general contractors who hire those contractors know. The developers who profit from hire, low, hiring low road cheating contractors, they know as well. The good contractors who play by the rules and get underbid by these cheaters, they definitely know. Everybody knows that a big segment of our industry is paying workers in cash under the table, that they're ignoring the laws, that they're not paying workers what they should be getting, that they're cheating their legitimate competitors with their artificially low bids, and that they're stiffing the state by not paying taxes on those dollars. It's widespread and it's happening in plain sight, and it's happening on projects that are financed with our tax dollars. The unions of the building trades are firmly united behind these bills to end this practice on publicly funded housing projects. Enough is enough, and these bills are a common sense solution to protect workers, ensure fair competition, and protect taxpayers from these fraudulent practices. This needs to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I also want to point out uh, Senator Hochschild is here. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'd just like to do, before we turn to questions, just a round of applause, please, for these powerful speakers. round of applause uh, for the representatives and, and senators that are here that are uh, leading this effort to stop exploitation on our project. So one more time. Thank you. And with that, we'll open the floor for questions. What do we have right now in place in terms of where prevailing wage has to be paid? Is that just state contracts? Um, that are like building state facilities? Is that where, where you're required to do prevailing wage? Yeah, thank you for that question. So many of the different funding sources that flow through Minnesota Housing Finance Agency do have prevailing wage. Um, so a lot of different uh, loans, grants, et cetera, state dollars have prevailing wage. What we found and that was quite shocking in the report is that these, these two big sources of public financing that don't have prevailing wage, LIHTC and TIF, are the places where we're seeing problem contractors over and over again. So I think that's really testament to what an effective tool prevailing wage is. It really is the gold standard of preventing uh, wage theft and exploitation. Uh, and so we're looking, along with a series of other measures, looking to take that golden tool that we have and extend it to these gaps that exist uh, currently. Is it DLI right now that does the, the enforcement of prevailing wage works required or enforcement of wage theft? Is that Department of Labor and Industry that does that now? Predominantly the Department of Labor and Industry, yes. And they just can't keep up with the amount that's going on, it sounds like. Well, with uh, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program and tax increment financing, there is not generally prevailing wage attached. So at Low Income Housing Tax Credit, gen mostly flows through Minnesota Housing Finance Agency from the federal level, it's a federal program. It also flows to some sub-allocators, uh, but that funding doesn't have prevailing wage. When it comes to TIF, it's generally set uh, sort of municipality by municipality or local unit of government by local unit of government. So in some cases there are uh, prevailing wage, but there's over 520 residential TIF districts, and the lack of prevailing wage is where we're seeing these problems pop up consistently. I think that those are 
private projects that are being privately built, but they've got part of the strings attached is that they have to set aside part of the some of the units or part of it for affordable housing. Is that how that works? Exactly. exactly. Yes. Uh, although, and I'll let um, either one of you uh, speak to this, but TIF is often used for um, affordable housing, but it also increasingly is used for private uh, projects in different communities and, and commercial projects. I don't know if you'd like to share some. Uh, yeah, I can, uh, I can speak to that. Yeah, TIF, um, so there, there are several different types of, of tax increment financing districts, TIF districts. Um, some are specific to housing and, and do carry a, an affordable component. Um, but TIF is uh, also, I would, I would say, very commonly, very extensively used for other commercial development. And representing, representing Bloomington, I have some experience with that. Like the strip by Southtown and all that, that whole area. The, that particular area, yes and no. It's it's a little bit tricky. There are TIF districts in that area. Um, not the in, the entire 494 strip is not a TIF district, but there is. There has been TIF use in, in that area. The Mall of America obviously has had uh, significant TIF use as well. Representative Howard, do you have anything you'd like to add? Any further questions? Yes, please. I had a question through the chair to Tulo. When you were being misclassified and having issues with your your contractor, who, who helped you get squared away and helped you make yourself whole again was that did you have did were you a member of the carpenters union at the time or did you just come to us and we helped you did you come to, our church? You come to the mic please really i don't understand it. when you started having your problems in your in your in your work yeah being paid where did you go to get the help to get your money and get squared away who oh, helped no. you get there well the labor department and they, and they put you in with the Carpenters Union then? Yeah. Lisa told me about Jorge, and I kept contact with him. So even if you're not a member, the Carpenters no. Union helped you? Is that correct? Yep. That, that was my question. <laughs> <All right>. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Any further questions? Thanks, everybody. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Have a wonderful afternoon.